Welcome to this edition of Theological Journal. We're with the historiographer. The official office chair was vital for Episcopal ministry by Matthew Payne. 21st century attention is easily diverted by the latest post, post or trending topic. But before the advent of electronic media, most attentiveness was committed to reading. The binge watch of the past was getting lost in a good book. The turn of the 20th century saw radio in its infancy, television only in people's imagination, and no one was going yet going to the movies. The primary information source beyond your neighbor was the printed word. Papers carried news, but filtered through the publisher's lens. The writing of the truth competed against an overwhelming amount of literary propaganda. It was during this time that Charles Chapman Grafton, 1830 to 1912, became the second bishop of Fond du Lac for his 1889 consecration. He was leader, ardent supporter, and advocate of the Oxford movement. Its efforts to reclaim the Catholic heritage, is, it argued, was inherent in the Episcopal Church and Anglicanism. Grafton made persuasive appeals supporting this message primarily through the printed and handwritten word. Grafton's influence may be best reflected by the posthumous eight-volume set, The Works of the Right Reverend Charles Grafton. These volumes measure more than a foot on the bookshelf. However, this pales in comparison to the dozens of linear feet of letters, sermons, pamphlets, and articles held in the Fond du Lac, Fond du Lac diocesan archives. Each flowed from his pen for over six decades. For many of those years, Grafton sat in a wood and leather chair, now sitting in the archives. It's got a pish picture with Bishop Grafton's in the background, his desk, chair, cane. The seat is 17 inches above the floor and a few inches less than a typical chair. Desk chairs developed during Grafton's lifetime as part of the Industrial Revolution. The chair could came about from an increase of administrative and office work. Charles Darwin crafted his own rolling chair in the 1840s by fitting it with cast iron legs which included uh, cast, uh, casters. These allowed him to examine specimens with getting out of his seat. You can see the chair at Darwin's Don't Home in Kent, England. The modern office chair came in the 1850s when inventor Thomas Warren designed a centripetal spring armchair made principally of men raised on casters, able to rotate on a singular column and adjust the seat angle. It became the first mass-produced office chair. Housed at the Brooklyn Museum, its clever metal spring system was concealed beneath a dense, soft curtain of luxurious passer -mentary. Both Darwin and Warren's developments happened when Grafton was in his 20s, being ordained a priest in 1858. Prior to being rector of the Church of Advent, Boston, 1872 to 1888, Grafton traveled extensively doing mission work in the United States and England. It's likely that Grafton's chair was acquired when he took up residence in Boston in the 1870s. We know Grafton's chair moved to Fond du Lac from Boston. In this chair, he composed most texts over the last half of his lifetime. The leather seat and tufted leather back bear signs of years of wear from sedentary activity. 
It swivels and rolls on four casters. Its arm supports arm supports reflect the chair's quality of manufacture, being of turned wood. The brass hardware includes a ring attached to the end of the right arm with a matching holder below it. This feature was clearly by design to hold something. It was not a later add-on as it integrated with the chair. Might it be said to hold a bishop's crozier? Many archives guests make this their first and incorrect guess. Perhaps it held a cane. Though Grafton used a cane later in life, this was not the purpose. To discern the purpose of the ring on the arm of the chair, the holder requires knowledge that gas lights and electric lights of the period were quite dim. This is a candlestick holder for use after the sun had set. A close candle better illuminated the ink on the page than a distant and dim light. An added benefit, no candle on the desk to drip wax or ignite papers if knocked over by an errant hand. One might wonder why a used deck chair and cane are kept in the archives. It is an artifact of the past which gives witness to history and has meaning because of what it represents. It was a tool used by this godly man. Perhaps its comfort increased its utility for the owner, but as a material object it was used to reach a pious goal. Matthew Payne is the historiographer and archivist of the Diocese of Fond du Lac in Wisconsin, Director of Operations for the Historical Society of the Episcopal Church. Bookshelf, Privilege and Prophecy, Social Activism in the Post-War Episcopal Church. Oxford University Press, April 22. In telling the story of the Episcopal Church's involving identity and activism during the period of 1945 to 79, the book offers an intimate picture of how Episcopal leaders understood their role and responsibilities. Okay, we will pick that up later. Why We Worship on Sunday by Reverend Daniel Schrock, pastor of Bethel Presbyterian in Wheaton, Illinois. Evangelical Christians will often point out Jesus' opposition to the legalism of the Pharisees and the Sabbath. Less attention, however, is sometimes given to the way that Jesus actually kept the Sabbath in the Gospels. He taught in synagogues on that day. These are concrete instances of habitual practice that we are told of in Luke 4.16. As was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. We certainly need to be mindful of the limitations of asking the question, what would Jesus do? Jesus does many things uniquely and unrepeatedly as the Messiah, including dying for the sins of his people. But the question is not completely illegitimate. We are to imitate Christ, 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. We should then ask the question, and when we ask it, one of the many answers the Bible gives to us is that Jesus would go to church on the Sabbath. Israel's week was punctuated by gathering in holy convocation on the Sabbath. It was the rhythm of his life. According to this pattern, it was corporate worship. It is wholly unsurprising then to find that the early church followed suit. The New Testament contains wide-ranging evidence that the first Christians assembled regularly for worship. The question is when. It is interesting that there is no explicit example in the New Testament of the Christian Jews and Gentiles gathering together for worship on the Jewish Sabbath. 
It's certainly not impossible that they would have assembled on varying days of the week. In Acts 20, Luke tells a story of Paul's preaching what seems to be an interminably long sermon, and a poor sleepy fellow named Eutychus dozes off and falls out a third-story window to his death. Good thing for Eutychus. Paul had the authority to raise him from the dead. What might be easy to overlook is the timing of this spectacular episode. Luke tells us that it happened on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread. The fact that he specifies the day of the week is unusual. Furthermore, his wording implies that such a gathering was a standing practice. Apart from when the apostles did something on the Sabbath, this is the only other instance in Acts when we are told of the specific day that the event happens. There is clearly something notable about the fact that the gathering of the church for word in sacrament in Troas happened on the first day of the week. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Paul instructs the church to gather a diaconal collection for Jerusalem on the first day of the week. In Revelation, we are told that John received visions on a specific day of the week. But here that day is given the very pregnant day name, the Lord's Day. John is employing verbiage that the early church after the New Testament used specifically for the first day of the week. The Lord's Day was common parlance for the parlance for the first day of the week. It appears in one of the earliest non-scriptural Christian documents, the Didache, which instructed Christians to assemble on that day and break bread. The early second century Bishop Ignatius of Antioch, who died in 110 AD, wrote, let every friend of Christ keep the Lord's Day as a festival, the Resurrection Day, the Queen and Chief of all the days of the week. Early Christians worshipped on Sunday, and it is clear from Acts, 1 Corinthians, and Revelation that this practice began during the days of the Apostles. The Resurrection is central to salvation. Through it, we have been born again. In the resurrection, we are justified and sanctified. And in it, we expect the completion of our adoption. Without the resurrection, we are pitiful, hopeless, and trapped in our sin. Christ's conquest of death is a foundation without which the whole edifice of the gospel comes crumbling down. But with it, the hope of our salvation is unassailable. The day of resurrection is the day of new creation. The Sabbath of the Old Testament explicitly commemorated two things. It commemorated the completion of creation and his deliverance of Israel in the Exodus. Why would we not expect it to be the instinct of Christians to gather in holy convocation now on the day when God completed his new creation and deliverance of his people in the greater and final exodus. The early church spoke of the Lord's day as the eighth day, knowing that it was the day that looked to the future when God would bring salvation to consummation. When we gather week after week with God's people, it ingrains in our hearts the hope that one day we will join our voices with the assembly of angels, the four living creatures, and the innumerable multitude of God's people, shaking the heavens with a thunderous chorus. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever. Resting in worship with the church on the Lord's day structures our work and lives in recognition that one day our king will be enthroned with all things under his feet and we will rest there 
eternally. We begin another article by Dr. Desmond Alexander, Senior Lecturer in Biblical Studies, Postgraduate Studies at Union Theological College in Belfast, Northern Ireland. He's the chairman of Tyndale Fellowship for Biblical and Theological Research, co-editor of the New Dictionary of the Bible, and author of several books. A Biblical Theology of Zion will make our beginning there. The famous hymn writer John Newton, 1725-1807, the slave trader turned ardent abolitionist, begins one of his best-known hymns with the words, <coughs> Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God. These opening words draw on the various biblical passages, especially Psalm 87.3. As Newton's hymn reveals in Christian thought the name of Zion, alongside the new Jerusalem has come to denote the eternal city of God, the goal of God's creative and redemptive activity. Zion is the holy metropolis where God's ethnically diverse people will live in God's presence, free from all pain, suffering, and the death associated with this present world. In the light of this future paradise, Newton's hymn concludes, Solid joys and lasting treasure none but Zion's children know. The name Zion did not always denote the eternal city of God. In the Bible, we first encounter the term in 2 Samuel 5, 6 and 7, which speaks of how David took the stronghold of Zion, the city of God. Due to their geogra geographical connection, Zion and Jerusalem are occasionally used in parallel to the same place, 2 Kings 1921. Through time, during the period when Davidic kings ruled over Judah, the designation Zion took on a special significance because of its association with God's temple in Jerusalem. Something of Zion's importance is conveyed in Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion is far north. He, city of the great king, with inner citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. The picture of Zion as the elevated holy city of God with its high citadels and solid ramparts provides the starting point for understanding the importance of the eternal city that is central to Christian thinking about life to come. The movement from an earthly Zion to what might be thought of as a heavenly Zion is predicted by the Old Testament prophets, especially Isaiah, a whole bunch of references. Around the end of the 8th century BC, Isaiah denounced the inhabitants of earthly Zion for their moral corruption and alienation from God. We'll pick that up and finish it in our next instance. Now we're being subject to authorities as salt and light. by Dr. George Grant, pastor of Parish Presbyterian Church, founder of New College Franklin, president of King's Meadow Study Center, and founder of Franklin Classical School in Franklin, Tennessee, the author of numerous books. Being subject to authorities as salt and light, the Apostle Peter declared, this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Pierre Verre, a forgotten giant of the 16th century magisterial reformation, 
carried out this order well. It was Viray who, along with his mentor, William Farrell, first bought, brought the Reformation to the city of Geneva in 1534. After the Genevan Disputation of 1535, he moved on to La Swain, where he witnessed great gospel fruitfulness. He was, ba he was back in Geneva in 1536, in time for a famously faithful meeting with John Calvin. It was then that the fiery Pharaoh threatened Calvin with divine retribution. He did not remain in the city to labor side by side with them. What is less often known is that it was Verret, Verret who softened Pharaoh's fulmination, persuading Calvin to stay. The next year, Verret was again in La Swain, overseeing the Reformation there. He pastored a thriving church and established the first academy for reformed theological training. It was there that Viray discipled Theodore Biza, who became the headmaster of La Swain Academy. It was also there that Viray discipled Guido de Brie, author of the Belgic Confession, as well as Zachary or Sinus and Caspar Oliavenus, author of the Heidelberg Catechism. When Calvin was banished from Geneva in 1538, Beret was called on to do the work of reconciliation and restoration. Beret's intercession persuaded the council to invite Calvin to return in 1541, and Beret persuaded his reluctant friend to accept the invitation. Whenever there is an intractable conflict in any of the churches throughout the Swiss cantons, Beret was enlisted to restore the purity and the peace. Such gospel fruitfulness was inevitably met by fierce opposition and persecution. After two decades of effectual witness, um, pressure from Bern forced Vire to flee from La Swain in 1559. He was joined in exile by all his fellow pastors, the professors of the academy, their students, and hundreds of citizens. They tasted the bittersweet truth that the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, and that great blessings and rewards await those who have been insulted, slandered, and hard-pressed upon to persevere. We may have to take us a, a break here. Bovere suffered the slanging ridicule and torments of the civil and ecclesiastical authorities of his day. He remained steadfast in the hope. He returned again and again to the surety of the power of the gospel to change lives. In 1 Peter 2.13, the Apostle Peter reminded the elect exiles of his day that they were but sojourners. They were to keep their conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they were reviled as evildoers, the revilers might see their good deeds and glorify God in faith. Thus the command to do good, and thus the promise that they should consequently silence the ignorance of foolish people. They were to live as people who are free, not using their freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants to God. Beret's great purpose, like Peter's before him, was reformation, not revolution. He therefore encouraged his people, as both beleaguered sojourners, to be the best subjects. He declared that there is no doubt that rulers, beyond compare, much are much better served by believers <coughs> who know the gospel than by any other men. Moray was deeply beloved in his day. To friend and foe alike, he was known as the smile of the Reformation. To others, he was the angel of the Reformation. 
and there is little brief wonder why. And now into the word, we're in July 2022, the giving of the law. Since God is our creator, we owe him obedience. The Lord gives us laws and we must obey them because it is our duty as rational creatures. Even before the fall, we were required to obey God, and that demand did not pass away once Adam sinned. If we owe God obedience, it is because we are his creatures. How much more should we want to freely be obedient in light of all that he's done for us? The Lord could have left us all to die in our sin and misery, <clears throat> and to suffer wrath eternally. But he did not do that. He sent his only begotten son to reconcile us to him. Seeking to obey him, in fact, is the least that we can do. We give him the thanks that is our due. This month, our study of Exodus brings us to Exodus 20, 1 through 13 which describes how the Lord gave the first six of the Ten Commandments to Israel. We see how God's giving of the law only after saving his people from slavery demonstrates that we do not merit salvation by keeping the commandments. We also work through the first six commandments, getting a taste of their comprehensiveness so that we can begin to understand how God's law addresses all of life and we'll bring this to a close here glory be to the father to the son and holy ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end amen godspeed